it's all over the city, you already have it, you're exposed, right? You're in a city, we're, right, we're in crowds, you know. No. It's, yeah, it's, it's just, it, no, if, if, it's, if it's out there, it's already probably too late. The, pro, the, the plus is, too late for what? You're going to get the coronavirus, you're not going to die from, most of the people. That's right, don't visit your grandpa. That's my only suggestion, is don't visit your grandpa. You know, seriously, don't go visit older people. Don't, that, that I would skip. I'm going, to, I'm going to Florida too to spring training. That's much better. Right. Okay, so I notice the numbers are dropping off. I guess the virus is getting, it's, it's having its toll. No. So um, let me ask you a question. How many of you would call yourself contrarians? How many of you would call yourself as contrarians? Okay. No, no, seriously, there's no plus or minus to it. I just want to know. So you, uh, three people were contrarian, contrarian, contrarian? Okay. How many of you have acted on it today? Did you act on it today? That's your definition of contrarian? <laughs> a lot of people in the class. If you are the only person in class, maybe, right? No. Anybody acted today? What are the two ways you can act on your contrarian? One is you can be a contrarian on the market, which means you think the market. Somebody did? You did? You bought or sold? Then that's not contrary. How is that contrary? You're part of the crowd, so you're basically part of the. No, that's fine. You can be part of the crowd. I didn't say it was bad. I just said you're part of the crowd. So be you can be part of the momentum. So if you sell, you're selling into the crowd. So be you can make money. There's nothing about being a contrary that uh, that's going to guarantee you making money, right? I'm sorry. What? Contrarian basically means you're going against the conventional wisdom. That's what it. No, no, words are easy, right? Talk is cheap. What did you do today to kind of back up what you just said? I didn't buy a face mask. You didn't buy what? A face mask. You didn't buy a face mask. Okay, that's a very minimalist standard of contrarian. No? But, but this is, a, I mean, from a valuation perspective, do you buy an airline stock? Did somebody do it? Yeah. Who do you buy? Okay, that, so I, I want to start with the discussion. First is, let's talk about contrary, contrary at the market level. If you're a contrary at the market level, what are you assuming? First, you're assuming that if there's an earnings drop, you're going to recover pretty quickly from it. And in fact, this morning I just posted it, depends on the size of the drop and how quickly. So if you feel that there's going to be a big drop in earnings, but it's all going to come back, then you definitely should be buying the market. But let's talk at the company level, right? If you're at the company level, you know, you're looking for carnage. You're looking for, would anybody buy Carnival Cruise Lines today? No. Yeah. But isn't that what contrary is? It's down 65%. Why would you not? I wouldn't buy it either. Hate cruises. You hate cruises. That's uh, either here or there. If enough people like it, even if you don't, if, even if you hate it, they're going to go up, right? So what, why would, would you buy Carnival Cruise Lines? They cannot what? Well, that's always been true. They, so they're going to lose money. It's not a question of whether they're going to lose money, but what's the big question with Carnival Cruise Lines that might hold you back? Have you seen all these TV, the networks carrying the, the cruise ship outside California? They, have these, they don't go close because they want to get catch it, I guess. But basically, you're seeing Petri dishes. That's what cruise ships are. Of, you know, and people are watching this and with Carnival Cruise Lines, the question you're asking is not whether they have fixed costs, because that's obviously an issue. They're going to lose money this year, but whether those people are ever coming back. So if any of you are going to act on your contrarianism, this is a question you need to be asking. Let's accept that this year companies are going to get hurt. Their earnings are going to drop and some companies are going to be hurt a lot. That's almost undebatable. At this point, it's beyond debate. That's going to happen. The question is, which of these companies are going to bounce back because of the kinds of stuff they sell, people will eventually, they deferred or delayed, but they eventually have to do it. And which, which of these companies are going to be damaged in a sense for the long term? Because those companies are not coming back, even if the market comes back. Carnival Cruise Lines, you know, my concern is that the business model might be broken. At this point, people are saying, do I want to put myself in a cruise ship? Even after the coronavirus, after you've seen this play out, 
I mean, this isn't the first time there's a Legionnaire's disease six years ago, right? Cruise ships are just, you know, the ventilation is bad. You've got a lot of old people on there. It's kind of a you know, perfect storm waiting to happen. And now that you've seen it happen, so, you know. What about um, airlines? So, do you think revenues and earnings will bounce back? Yeah. yeah. Will they bounce back quicker for some airlines than others? So if you're looking across airlines, how do you decide whether you want to buy United or Singapore Air or, you know, what, you know, what yeah. You'd go for big over small because they're too big to fail, so basically. My ideal would be that they could take a bigger In fact, you want them to survive, right? Because even if you're right about things coming back, if they're not around, you're not going to benefit. So big might not be what you want to use because big airlines have gone bankrupt too. So you might want to look at something that's a more direct measure or will they make it, which is how much debt do they have? How much buffer have they built? I'd rather buy Southwest than I would United. United is much closer to the edge. It's a much more highly levered airline. So you have access to S&P Capital IQ. You can screen on Capital IQ. You can go through airlines and say, find me all the airlines with revenues greater than a certain amount with less than 30% of the revenues from Asia because that might be the part where it's with less than certain amount of debt because you're looking for, even if you're right about a rebound, it's not going to be across the board. Contrarian investing is a lot more difficult than it looks from the outside because you have to discriminate. And what triggered today's carnage in the market? Oil price is dropping to $32 a barrel. Let me ask you a question. At $32 a barrel, what's the only oil company in the world that can make money? Aramco. Everybody else. At $32 a barrel, you are completely and totally screwed if you're not. You're saying, this is good. They'll get 100% of the market. Do they want 100% of the market? Remember, there are only 330 million barrels of oil under the Saudi sands. You don't want to use it all up in 10 years. Right now, they produce like 9 million. They've increased 11. They don't want to push it up to 33 million. So this is not a steady state. You know that oil at 32 is not sustainable. It's going to go back up. So you're trying to decide oil companies to invest in, right? You could go with Aramco, but you can't even buy the damn stock. It's like, you know, it's a closed room. You can't even get into the room. But to decide whether you buy Exxon, Mobil, or Royal Dutch, I would suggest the same thing as with airlines, which is you're looking for airlines with the, what, what, what characteristics? I'm sorry, oil, oil companies with what characteristics? You want, no debt might be too much of a requirement, but very low debt. So you definitely want to avoid the shale oil companies because they're all not only high production costs, but high debt. You want a combination of reasonably low production costs because oil prices might never go back to $75 a barrel plus low debt. And you know what? If you go to Capital IQ, you can screen for both of those. You can look for companies with debt less than 10% of the value of the firm, or 10% 10, 10 of EBITDA, whatever you want to put as a screen, as well as what the cost, production cost per barrel is. You want low production cost per barrel plus low debt. You know, I, I, when, I, when we talked about risk, I, I, I think I said, you will know it when you feel it. Do you feel it now? And you don't even have money in the market. If you had money in the market, you'd really feel it, right? The reason you don't have money is then why you take all of your excess money and says give it as tuition. But presumably, if you have money, you'd feel that this is risk. Remember the, you know, this, these, these three weeks, and they might not be over because you know, 10, 20 years from now, there's going to be somebody young who joins your firm and says, what is this risk again? Don't, markets always go back up after they go down. Remember these moments. Markets don't always bounce back. And they don't always do it quickly. And what you're seeing today is kind of fear and risk play out. Now, now risk is that feeling in the pit of your stomach as you try to trade something and you're going against the crowd. So let's talk a little bit about the loose ends for today. No? So today we're going to talk about a bunch of loose ends. Let's start with that. Let's say you've done a discounted cash flow valuation of a company. You come up with a value of 100 million. So free cash flows firm discount the cost of capital. You want to get to the value of equity, so you're getting ready to subtract out debt. The company has debt with a face value of 100 million, but a market value of only 80 million. So how can that be? What causes the market value of debt to drop below the face value? I'm sorry, what? Interest rates going up could be one. What's the other? 
if the company gets more distressed, right? If it gets more distressed, the default risk goes up. So for whatever reason, the market value of debt has dropped, perhaps because it's distressed. My question is, what's the value of equity in this company? And actually, this should be 20 million, not 200 million. You know, so cross out the last zero. Should it be 20 million, zero, or some other number? First, you see where the 20 million comes from, right? You take the 100 million, you subtract out the market value of debt, you get 20 million. That's actually what every textbook asks you to do. But would you be a little worried about why you got the 20 million? You still owe 100 million in debt, right? The market says it's worth only 80 million. You still owe 100 million. You could actually argue that if you liquidated the firm today and you got the entire value of the firm, remember the bank is not going to say just pay me 80 million, they're going to say pay me the 100 million. So this is one of those gray areas in valuation where the rules say always subtract out market value, but when you have deeply distressed companies and the market value of debt is well below the book value, you might want to reconsider that rule. Okay. One final point. Let's assume I do a valuation of the equity in a company. I take free cash flow at equity, discount the cost of equity. I come up with a value of equity of a billion dollars for the company. The company has 100 million shares outstanding. This is very easy, so there's no trick here. What's the value per share? Billion divided by 100 million is $10 per share, right? That was easy. Now let's assume this company decides to give 10 million options to its CEO with a strike price of $10 basically makes it look like an at-the-money option, right? We said the value per share. So they're basically giving away 10 million shares. Just think intuitively whether you as an equity investor, so a moment ago these options were not there. Now the options have been granted and the company says, don't worry about it. They're at-the-money options. They're worth nothing. Would you go along? Are they really worth nothing? Right now exercising it doesn't make sense, right? But what's the essence of an option? The CEO gets a right to exercise it next year, two years out. Do you think the company's given away something that's yours when they did this? Right. In fact, that option was your equity. Every time companies grant equity, a piece of the equity that belongs to you and I is being given away. Okay. And that equity has to be valued. Now the question of how we value it, we're going to talk about today because it's definitely not the second answer. You can't say nothing happened to me. These options are at the money. The question of how to adjust for that value is one of the things we're going to examine today. Starting with a very, what I call a bludgeon approach. We just adjust the number of shares for the options outstanding all the way to what I think is doing it right, which is figuring out what the options are actually worth. So ready? Let's go back to the notes because I think we were on cross holdings and we were waving our hands on, hey, what do you do? when you have all the information. In the case of Yahoo, for instance, the Alibaba holdings in Yahoo Japan, I did a full-fledged intrinsic valuation of each piece. But I was able to do it, why? Because Yahoo Japan was a standalone publicly traded company with its own financials, and Alibaba had just gone public with its own financials. I could do a full-fledged, but it was a pain. To value Yahoo, I had to value three companies. In most cases, though, you're not going to get that luxury of full financial statements for every part of the company. I'll tell you a story to illustrate how difficult it is in practice to actually get these numbers. About 20 years ago, I was writing one of the, oh no, it was the second or third edition of one of my valuation books. I was valuing a Japanese company. And in the late 90s, we were valuing a Japanese company who were teetering on the edge of disaster. Because the risk-free rate in Japanese yen was so much lower than the risk-free rate elsewhere in the world that if you're not careful, the valuation would implode on you. But I was careful. I finished the valuation. I'm patting myself on the back. I take a look at their annual report and they tell me that they have 153 cross holdings. Actually, 226 cross holdings. 153, I'll come back later. 226 cross holdings. My task is laid out for me, right? Because if I decide to approach it the way I did Yahoo, what do I have to do next? Value each of the 226 companies to get the value of one company. I'm a lazy person. There's no way I'm even going there. But if I were not lazy and I wanted to go there, I couldn't have anywhere. And here's why. I think 153 out of the 226 companies were private businesses, and there was zero information provided on these businesses. No revenues, no operating income. So I called the investment relations officer for this Japanese company and said, look, I'm valuing a company. It's not for an expose. I would like some information on your cross holdings. She said, I cannot give you that information. It's proprietary. The way she said proprietary was kind of scary. And I said, really? 
Yeah, she said yes. I said, what if I bought a thousand shares in your company and then called you? She said, it would still be proprietary. I said, that doesn't make any sense. If I own a thousand shares in your company, I'm part owner of the company. You're refusing to tell me what I own. She thought about it for a moment. She said, you have a point, but it's still proprietary. <laughs> At this stage, I'm saying, why am I banging my head against a brick wall? I get ready to hang up the phone. She says, I cannot give you specifics, but I can give you some information on these cross holdings. So I thought maybe she'd give me book value or revenue. So I said, what? She said, I can't give you the numbers, but I to tell you they're worth a lot. <laughs> I said, let me get this. My Excel spreadsheet, do I enter L-O-T in that cell? It's not working. It's giving me an error message. How many zeros are there in a lot? But it kind of cuts to the heart of the cross-holding culture, right? What do managers do? They hold up a brown paper bag. They trust me, it's full of cash. Can I look in the bag? No, I'll tell you how much is in the bag. Just take my word for it. That's exactly what we're doing with cross-holding companies. We're taking the word that managers say, this is what it's worth. We're adding it on. Why would they ever let you look in the bag? We get the companies we deserve. And as long as we keep giving these companies what they say, the cross-holdings are worth, it's exactly what you're going to see. So I'm going to give you two shortcuts I use when I run into companies where I cannot get the information the cross holdings. If they can give me the book value of their holdings, and many of them will in the balance sheet, rather than use the book value as the estimated value of their holdings, I'm going to try to convert it into market value. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose you have a company with a cross holding in a chemical company, and that cross holding has a book value of 100 million. What if I told you that a typical chemical company trades at one and a half times book value? Because I can get that from looking at publicly traded chemical companies. You know what I'm going to use as your estimated value for your chemical holding? I'm going to take the $100 million book value times 1.5. You're saying, that is so sloppy. With the information I have, that might be better than just using book value. For the companies that are publicly traded, I'm going to cheat. But even for the Japanese companies, 73 of the companies were publicly traded. You know what I used for their value? They were publicly traded, so what could I look up? I looked up their stock price. It's cheating, because in intrinsic valuation, you're supposed to mistrust markets, but I'm too lazy to value 73 companies. Much of what happens in practice out there uses one of these shortcuts. In fact, many of them use book value and then try to dance around it. So if you look at... Uh, at, Yahoo, at the breakdown of Yahoo, here's what I did if I were pricing it rather than doing an intrinsic valuation. So you have given up an intrinsic valuation. I start off by pricing Yahoo using enterprise value to sales. Basically, I look at a multiple of revenues they trade at, and I come up with the value for Yahoo. I price Yahoo Japan, and I price Alibaba, basically applying a multiple to whatever number I can observe. I get a pricing very similar to what I got in the intrinsic valuation. That's purely coincidence. Most people who have to deal with cross sortings either price them by looking at what the market is paying or by applying a multiple. They don't do an intrinsic valuation often because they cannot do it. But if you can get to the information, you'd much rather value the company. Let's face it, there, when you buy SoftBank, which trades at a discount in book value, whether you like it or not, you're buying Alibaba. You know why? Because right now, about 25% of SoftBank's value comes from its holdings of Alibaba. You're actually getting Alibaba at a discount in a strange way, just like you know with Yahoo you were. You're getting it at a discount because SoftBank trades at a discount on book value, and its book value includes Alibaba marked up to market price. But if I have to do an intrinsic value of SoftBank, I really should be doing an intrinsic value of Alibaba, right? Because indirectly, that's what I'm getting. So any questions on cross holdings? So let's see where we are. You've done a discounted cash flow valuation. You've added cash, either in full or with a discount if you don't trust the managers. You've added the cross holdings to the extent you can. Then you look around and say, is there anything else I should be adding on to my valuation? You look at the balance sheet. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing something. So I'll give you the rule because it's easy to get carried away here. When you think about adding things on, remember you can't count something twice. I'll give you a very simple example. Let's assume you value a bank. Okay? You come up with a value and you say, I'm done with the value. Then you look at the fact that they own a headquarters building in downtown Manhattan, which is worth a billion dollars. Big building. Can you add the billion on to your discounted cash flow valuation? Because after all, they own the building. It's worth a billion. Can you add the billion on to the value? Why or why not? Who 
Who's in that building? Traders, bankers, what are they doing? Presumably something that creates revenues and income, right? Which you valued already when you valued the bank. You can't value the cash flows in an asset and the assets up. That's double counting. So most of the stuff you see in the balance sheet, you should be adding to your DCF valuation. So if I value an oil company, I should be adding the value of the refineries and the ships on top, because the value of the oil company comes from the cash flows those assets create. So what are you looking for? You're looking for truly vacant assets, things that don't contribute to your bottom line, can never contribute to your bottom line, but the company owns it and it's valuable. I'll give you, you know, in an extreme example. Let's say your CEO likes to collect Picassos. Don't ask me why. So you've got Picassos all around the, 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 the ninth floor. They belong to the company. Use this company money to buy. To value this company, after you've done your DCF valuation, you should be adding the, the, the pricing of those Picassos on because they belong to you. So you're looking for something that's truly vacant. Okay? So I'm going to give you an example that will stick, even if you don't like it. You know, there's a fund called the Michael Price Fund at Stern. Have you heard of it? Michael Price uh, was a this very wealthy individual. He became very wealthy because he built a mutual fund business that he sold to the Japanese about 20 years ago at the peak of the market. And he collected about $2 billion from the sale, which made him an overnight a very wealthy person. When you, have a, when you become overnight a very wealthy person, Stern always notices. <laughs> Why? Because they come to ask you for money. Now, one of my rules with Stern is don't ever ask me to go ask somebody for money because I'm going to tell them never to give you money. So it's not a good idea. But this time they said, you know what, we'd like you to raise the money for a very specific purpose. It's a good cause and you might, you know, you might like it. He said, we'd like to raise money to create a fund that MBAs can run so you can get you know, their hands dirty, you know, picking stocks and running a fund. So we went and we got some money from Michael Price and we started this portfolio called the Michael Price Fund. It's run by MBAs. And every year a group of MBAs is selected to run the fund and they pass it on to the next group. So basically over. And it's done okay. It's done as well as any active money management. In. I have zero role with the fund. That's the other rule I imposed is don't ever ask me to do things with this fund because I don't believe in this year to year changing your philosophy with new people coming in. But almost everybody who is in that fund, who runs that fund, has gone through one of my classes. So the way the fund works is if you want them to buy a stock, you've got to pitch it to the other people in the group, and they either decide yes or no. So every time somebody has a pitch prepared, guess who they try it out on? They come into my office and say, can I pitch a stock to you, and you tell me whether it works? So this is about 15 years ago. I'm sitting there minding my own business. One of the people in the fund comes in. He was in my valuation class. I never liked the guy. Uh, it's, it's a, usually I don't have personal feelings, but this guy I didn't like. He, come, he came in and says, I'm facing a conundrum. I very quickly turned to my computer, typed in the word conundrum. Turned out he was confused. I know, but the word, so I thought I liked the word I was going to use. I said, what's your conundrum? He said, my conundrum is I'm valuing Playboy. I said, I don't see a conundrum yet. He said, and I valued, he said, no, no, let me continue. He said, I valued Playboy at 240 million. It's trading at 280 million. And I said, I still don't see a conundrum. It doesn't look like a good company. Move on. And he said, well, here's my conundrum. Seventh time in like two minutes, we've used the same word. No. He said, the conundrum is that Playboy has this very valuable asset that I haven't counted in my 240 million. What do you think? Of it? Don't get, take your mind out of the gutter. No? What do you think the asset he had in common? It's not the bunnies. They're already in the cash flows. It's not the playmates. What, what is it? What's a, what house? The Playboy Mansion. One of the most valuable pieces of property in LA. It's what, at that time, it was, you know, it was priced around 100 million. So you could see what his conundrum was. If you add the house on, to the 240 million that he got, it looked undervalued. So the question he was asking was, can I count the house? I said, technically, they own the house, but there's one small problem counting the house. There's an 85-year-old in a bathrobe hanging out there <laughs> that you don't exactly want to evict. You know what I'm talking about, right? Hugh Hefner lived in the house. You can't exactly throw him out of the house. He said, what should I do? I said, check the actuarial tables. He said, what am I checking for? Check to see how long 85-year-olds in bathrobes who surround themselves with 26-year-old playmates tend to live. 
It's a kind of stress you don't want to put on a heart at 85. <laughs> it takes five years. You see what he has to do next? He takes the price of the house five years out. He discounts the house back five years. You can, if you want to get fancy and use a real estate cost of capital, be my guest. You take the present value, add it to the 240 million. And then you, I don't think they bought Playboy, but that is a classic vacant asset. And then I forgot about it all for a while. And then about five years later, I opened up the Wall Street Journal and found that Playboy came up with a really creative way to sell the house with Hugh Hefner in it. I'm not kidding. They sold it to this Greek you know, billionaire who bought the house on the condition that Hugh Hefner could continue to live in the house till he died. Knowing, I mean, if he'd known Hugh Hefner, that guy would probably kind of made sure he breathed for another 35 years. But this basically is a completely vacant asset, an asset you haven't counted that you're going to bring in. So if you're valuing a company and it's got an 85-year-old founder living in a mansion in Hawaii that belongs to the company, then you might have to deal with this issue. But this is the kind of asset that you think about when you think about what else should I be adding on. Let's move on to the fourth loose end. I want you to think like an investor. I'm going to present you with two companies that look exactly the same in terms of numbers. Same operating income, same tax rate, same return on capital, same growth rate, same cost of capital. They look exactly the same. But here's where they're different. Company one is in a single business, has a very simple holding structure. You know exactly what they own. They tell you what in the balance sheet. And has transparent accounting. They describe what they do, and it's pretty easy to understand how much money they made, how much they own, what they own. Company B has the same numbers, but is in multiple businesses as a complex holding structure. They have cross-holding, special purpose entities, and they have opaque accounting. You know what opaque accounting is? This is one of those annual reports you read and you're not sure what language it's in. You read it again, you get even more confused. It's written by lawyers, for lawyers, off lawyers. It's clearly designed to confound you. So here's my question. Both companies have the same numbers. Think like an investor. Which of these two companies, one is a simple company, the other is a complicated company. Would you value the simple company more highly? The complicated company more highly, or would you be indifferent between the two? I want you to think for a moment, because I want everybody to have a vote on this. How many picked the simple company? I'm going to put my hand up as well. So don't let this color your choice. How many picked the complicated company, and why? What's your rationale? Give me a right. But they're holding it back, so you don't know what you don't know, right? So there's nothing to interpret. Basically, you can try to, do, but basically, they're holding back information. And how many would be indifferent? I'm going to put my hand up as well, because you read my books and you start plugging in numbers. Where in our discounted cash flow valuation do we allow for complexity, right? Same cost of capital, same cash flow, same growth rate. I would value two companies the same. You know, I'll give you the basis for that practice, and it's a very dangerous assumption. You can see why it's going to get us into trouble. We assume that what you don't know can't hurt you. We assume that what you don't know gets averaged out. If I buy 100 complex companies, remember the diversification argument? It's going to get diversified away, but here's the problem. What you don't know at these companies is what managers have chosen to hold back. Right? Let me ask you a follow-up question on that. What do managers hold back, good news or bad news? bad news? Or let me rephrase that. How many accounting scandals do you wake up to where the company says, hey, guys, we paid five times more money than I, when we told you we did? Remember, when you get a surprise, it always seems to be a negative surprise. What you, can't, what you don't know can hurt you. I'll tell you when this came up to the surface. I think it was... Um, 2000, 2001, it was a, I'm trying to think of the name of the company, it was a conglomerate that had been built up and an accounting scandal caused it to kind of implode and it lost 80% of its value. It was during a valuation class. And um, I came into the company and it was, a, it was a company that had been built up over time, all kinds of accounting scandals come up, stock price collapses. 
So I come to the class and said, you know what, you know, uh, guys, this, this seems to be a problem. It, 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 what they held back was obviously more bad news than good news. Now, and what made this surprising was in the period where the, that, that company fell apart, GE lost 15% of its value. You see, what's one company? What turned out to allow this company to do what it did was it was a conglomerate that grew through acquisitions, and it had used the process to cover up a lot of bad stuff. You see why investors were punishing GE? In 2001, they were thinking, it's a conglomerate, it's grown through acquisitions. How do we know it's not holding back bad stuff as well? So I throw this out to the class and say, you know, what do you, what do you think? Should we be bringing complexity to the valuation? Because the market obviously cares. To a person, every person in the class says, oh, yeah, yeah, we should be bringing it in. And I said, okay. If we decide to bring it in, here are the two things we need. We need to, A, come up with a measure of complexity because we can't just say, hey, if we see it, we will know it. And second, we've got to bring that complexity somewhere to the numbers, into the cash flows, the discount rate, or the growth rate. And they all agreed it was a great idea. So I said, okay, how do we measure complexity? And they said, you're teaching the class, why don't you come up with something? I said, well, you're right. So the next session, I came back with my first measure of complexity, and they were not impressed. I just counted the number of pages <laughs> in the 10K. I know you're saying, this is so unsophisticated. Let me ask you a question. Among those 10 companies, if you wanted to avoid a company, which of those companies do you want to avoid valuing? 1,026 pages in an annual finding. This is in war and peace. This is how many pages it took them to tell me what happened last year. It takes you 1,000 pages to tell me what happened last year. You want heck of a screwed up company. <laughs> So I put this up, and my MBAs are not impressed. They said, we're not paying $150,000 to count pages. We'd like something more sophisticated. I said, what was I thinking? I'll be back next session. And the next session, I came back with what I call my valuation shit list. It's my technical term. These are things in a company that bother me and how much they bother me. And I'm capable of building a spreadsheet on pretty much everything. I remember my daughter had a lot of trouble picking between colleges. And finally, I got sick and tired of her hemming and hawing. And I said, I'm going to build a spreadsheet. Tell me what matters to you. I'll put weights on it. It'll come. She never used it. But I can convert almost anything into a spreadsheet. So I said, I'm going to take everything that bugs me when I value a company, put it into a spreadsheet, and come up with a complexity score. So I'll give you some of the things that bother me. A company that claims to be geographically diversified, but doesn't tell you where. What am I supposed to do with this? Or it tells you where, and you start looking at the regions of the world they claim to be in, and you don't recognize any of them. I remember when I first valued BMW, so 20 years ago, they have breakdown of revenues. Remember, we had to compute an equity risk premium. So they have Europe, they have North America, they have South America, they have Asia, then they have Oceania. I'm trying to think of my geography class, Africa, Australia. Where the hell is Oceania? Maybe the lost continent of Atlantis. Maybe they're selling to people underground. So I called the investment relations officer at BMW. I said, where the heck is Oceania? And she said, it's Australia, New Zealand, and Indonesia. I said, what do they have in common? She said, by an ocean. I said, really? That's your definition of Oceania? If I use that literally, 85% of the world is Oceania. What am I left with? Landlocked countries like Latvia? But by combining Indonesia with Australia, do you see why you've made my life difficult? Remember the equity risk premium for Australia is like the US, the mature market. You throw in Indonesia in there, and you don't tell me how much comes from each. What do I do? And companies do this deliberately. They screw it up to make it difficult. So I took everything that bugs me and how much it bugs me, and I built a weighted score. The higher the score, the more complex the company. So I came back to my class, and I showed them exactly this page. And I said, do you like this more? And they said, a lot. This is so much better than counting pages. I said, there's one cost to using this valuation shit list. To come up with a score for Citigroup, what do I need to do? read 1,024 pages. And I said, there's no way I'm doing it. But each of you is valuing a company, right? Like, then I required people. And they could see the train coming at them down the track style. <laughs> but too late now, they said yes. And I said, this semester, in addition to valuing a company, why don't you come up with a complexity score for your company as well? They bitched and they moaned. 
<laughs> but what choice would they have? They should have just taken the number of pages I suggested in the previous session. And that semester, in fact, that was one added list to the to-do list for the project to come up with a complexity score. But very interesting things came out of that, that semester. The first is, there was almost no correlation between company size and complexity. I thought big companies would be complex and small companies would be simple. No, there was no correlation. Second, they found that emerging market companies were about 20 to 25 percent more complex than developed market companies simply because of holding structures, cross holdings, and the messes created. Third, they found that any company that grew through acquisitions, and if any of you are valuing companies with acquisitions, you're probably already sensing this, was almost 30 percent more difficult to value than a company that grew with internal projects. Why? Because acquisitions are lumpy, they're impairment, goodwill, all kinds of crap showing up. And finally, any company with a financing arm embedded in it was about 40 percent more difficult to value than a company without. You know what I'm talking about? GM, GMAC, Ford, Ford Capital. You're saying, what's the problem? You've embedded a bank right in the middle of your company, and you're saying, trust me, I'm going to put a Chinese wall around the bank and tell you what the bank has. I have no way of knowing. You grow through acquisitions. You're a multi-business company. You have a financing arm. If I were designing a company as a torture instrument, maybe I'm the devil, and your analysts will end up in hell. And I wanted to give you a company, it's like Groundhog Day. Every day you have to wake up and value this company over and over and over again. You know who I'd pick as your company? Lots of acquisitions, multiple businesses, multiple countries, has a financing arm. How to pick GE? GE is my vision of hell. <laughs> and I'll make you valued with a Dell computer if need be. No Macs allowed. No. So basically one of those, you know. Some companies are more complex than others. And the sooner we accept that, the better. And you're going to see this play out. Markets like, in good markets, people ignore complexity because they feel, you know, it's OK. In markets where people are scared like this one, complexity is going to be a problem. So if you can put a screen for complexity, when you're looking for companies to invest in, you're better off. You don't want companies where there's other stuff that's kind of making the waters murky. Yep. What was the correlation between the length of the It was very, very high. Right? Basically, it turns out that the number of pages is a pretty good measure of what the eventual complexity is. So when you now we don't even print it off anymore, thank God for that. But when you go into SEC and you download that 10K for your company, if it downloads and downloads and downloads, you have to go to sleep, and the next morning it's still downloading, I would switch companies. Now, this is basically not a good sign that it takes you like 16 hours to download a 10K. But the question now becomes, remember the it proposition? If I believe complexity matters, I now have to find a number to reflect. And I'll give you the choices. You can take the aggressive analyst role of saying, if I don't see it, I won't value it. The problem is that's going to take a whole bunch of companies off the list. You can take the other extreme and say, you know, it, it's OK. They're going to tell me the truth. You're trusting managers, which is what often happens in upbeat markets, bullish markets. Or you have to find a number to change. And here are your choices. You can haircut the cash flows for complex companies. You know what I mean by that? You get expected cash flows for complex companies. You say, but there's a lot of going on here. I don't quite understand. I'm going to reduce them by 5%, 10%. The problem with haircuts is they're completely arbitrary. They just come from your gut. The second is I can use a higher cost to cap for complex companies. Risk-free rate plus beta times risk premium. It's not going to show up. So you have to figure out something extra you add for complex companies. And I'll give you one way in which you can estimate. In fact, that month I spent on complexity during my sabbatical, here's what I did. I took the S&P 500, and I cleaved it into two halves. One half was simpler companies. The other half were complex companies. Remember how I computed an implied equity risk premium for the entire index? I did for each half. And I found the complex companies at a cost of capital 1.2% higher than the simple companies. So I need no theory. That's basically what the market is doing. I can build it into my cost of capital for a company. But I'll give you my favorite device. What do we say the value of growth comes from? How high your return on capital is relative to your cost of capital, right? So let's say you have a company with a 15% return on capital. Its cost of capital is 9%. You sit down to value the company. The longer you allow it to maintain that 15% return on capital, the more valuable the company is, right? 
How long I allow you to earn a 15% return on capital will depend on how much I understand where the 15% return on capital is coming from. So if you're a transparent company and I can see exactly where your excess returns are coming from, then I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to assume that can, you can keep doing this for the next 10 years. But let's say you're a complex company. I can see you're making money, but I have no idea why. How can I assume you can keep doing it for the next 10 years? So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to close that gap much more quickly. And I'm hoping to smoke you out because if you're a company and you say, that's not fair, I'm going to say, okay, tell me more. Let me understand the company because that's really what drives whether I give those excess returns. And finally, if uh, as the last part of what I did in the session, I actually, in this, in this month, I took the price to book ratios, the 100 largest market cap companies, and ran a regression against return and equity, bait and growth. And we'll come back and talk about those are standard variables used to explain price to book ratios. And I threw the number of pages in the 10K into the regression. Read this coefficient for me, minus 0 0.003. What is it telling you? Every 100 additional pages in your 10K lowers your price to book ratio by 0 0.30, right? Let's say Citigroup's price to book is 0 0.9, and it's pretty close to 0 0.9. And they come to you, you're a consultant, a value consultant. And they ask you for advice. What should you tell them to do? Knock 300 pages off your 10K and you'll be doubling your price to book. Sounds facetious. But if you think about why Citigroup's 10K is so monstrously big, it can trace it back to a day in 1998 when John Reed, who was then CEO of Citibank, stood next to Sandy Weil, who was the CEO of Travelers Group, and they said they were going to create the largest supermarket in the world, a financial supermarket. Bank, insurance company, realtor, all rolled into one. This was not an accident, it was a direct consequence of building this incredibly complex company. And what this regression is saying, the market is punishing you for being complex, go back to being simpler. I think right now money center banks are being pummeled, and this has been true since the 2008 crisis. Partly because people really don't understand what's going on inside. Because all you get is a scandal every three years, you lost two billion, you lost three billion, and finally people are saying, I have no idea what's going on. They're punishing banks because they're complex. If I were advising Jamie Dimon, I'd say break up JP Morgan into five companies, you'd be worth more simply because the complexity will get reduced and people can value your trading business if it's truly profitable very differently than that. Right now they're punishing everybody, saying I have no idea what's going on. So when companies devise complex plans, what are the things you've got to factor in is what is it going to cost me? Now let's talk about debt. There are two places in valuation where you run into debt. The first is when you compute cost of capital, and there the rule is keep it narrow. Debt for cost of capital should be all interest-bearing debt and the present value of lease commitments. So starting this year, that's already going to be debt. So basically, that's it. Don't, get, don't start adding in underfunded pension obligations and healthcare obligations. The reason is very simple. The more you pile into debt, the higher debt ratio will become, the lower your cost of capital will become. So in trying to be conservative, we'll actually be rewarding the company. So that's to get a value. But once you use the cost of capital to value the company, you have to be more expensive in your definition of debt. And there are a couple of things I want to talk about. Okay? The first is what I gave you at the start of the class, which is, you know, should you use book value and mar or market value? No, and if you use book value, the company's, the equity is worth nothing, and if you use market value, the equity is worth a lot, be very careful about paying that as your equity value, because overnight, that could disappear. If what happens? If somebody acquires the company, that is, that is, so if you're acquiring this company, you have to be very careful that you don't pay 500 million. Maybe as a passive investor, you can buy it at 500 million, hope that the discount disappears gradually over time as the company gets more valuable, but it's a very dangerous game. And if you think about doing a liquidation value, then you definitely have to use book value. Because as I said, if you liquidate the company, you can't go to the bank and say, I'll pay you half what I owe you, even though the market might say that's what it's worth. You have to pay the entire book value. So should you subtract book or market? If you're doing a liquidation valuation, always subtract out book. If you're doing a DCF valuation as a going concern, you can do market, but if the number is very different from the book, I would do both, and maybe the judgment call you've got to make is where in the middle would I come in and buy the stock? Okay. Yes? Uh, when you're doing most complex companies, wouldn't it just make more sense to do a sum of parts valuation than having a return? For the sum of the parts valuation, what do you need? You need financials, 
at every piece of the company, right? Complexity can actually get multiplied when you try to do that because these complex companies often the kinds of information they give you on businesses is so fuzzy. So some of the parts valuation actually works best for transparent companies with multiple businesses. That break, United Technologies, the company I'm going to use in our class to break it, had very good information at the business level. So I was able to do it. I'll show you my GE, some of the parts valuation, much fuzzier because the entanglements between GE Capital and the rest of the businesses make it really messy to figure out where one business ends and the other begins. So it's not a panacea, but if you have the information at the business level, then the company's probably pretty transparent to begin with because it's broken things down at the business level. Yeah. Let's talk about final loose ends. You've taken the value of the firm, you've subtracted our traditional debt, and you're looking around saying, is there anything else I should be worried about? And one of the things you have to remember is, at least in the US, pretty much every company is being sued at any point in time. And to the extent that some of these are nonsense suits, you might say, I don't care about nuisance suits. But if there are suits that cut to the heart of your business model. I remember when BlackBerry was being sued by this, this technology guy who claimed that the company had stolen the technology to make the BlackBerry. You lose that suit, your entire company goes away. Right now, if you value buyer, Right? We talked about buyer owning Monsanto. You're going to find that the company looks undervalued. I'll, I, I'll, I'll predict that even without looking at your numbers. If you look at just the numbers, you do a discounted cash flow valuation, the company's going to look cheap. But before you buy the stock, here's what I want you to think about. What's, whole, what's hanging over buyer's market value? The Monsanto lawsuits from, from, from Roundup, and that's going, you know it's going to cost you money, whether you lose every lawsuit, every other lawsuit. So to value, Mons to value buyer, you know what you have to do? You have to estimate how much those lawsuits will cost you. And that is a nightmare, because this is nothing to do with finance, it's got everything to do with law. About um, four or four, no, long, more than that, 10 years ago, I was sitting in my office, a couple of law students comes in from the NYU Law School. And they said, we're facing an existential crisis. I said, OK. They said, we're in our final year of law school. We don't want to be lawyers. So why are you telling me this? Go tell your dean this. You know? Three years of law school tuition down there. They said, we'd like to get in, go into investing. Can you make some suggestions on a, you know, modeling classes we can take? And I said, it's too late. You've already invested in this law degree. Your skill set is not this. You can't, you'll never be a nin, an Excel ninja, right? So that's not going to help you. They said, are you telling us? We, I said, maybe there's a, there's a niche market for you. I said, why don't you hang up your shingles and say, we will focus only on companies that have been targeted in big lawsuits. And here's what we will do. We won't do, won't do any of the modeling and projecting of earnings and cash flows. There are other people who are better at this. We're going to focus on two things. One is, what is the likelihood that we will lose a lawsuit? We are lawyers. We, are, we're, you know, we can do the trial. So we'll get trial lawyers into, kind of into our team. And second, what will the expected payout be? Right. Neither is an easy number. But let's face it, the rest of us can't even imagine what, because remember, in a, in a lawsuit, it's not whether you lose the lawsuit, but the appeals process and how it eventually plays. It's an incredibly messy process. For 30 years for tobacco companies, this has become the make it or break it part of your valuation. The DC valuation is simple in a tobacco company. In fact, tobacco stocks are among the least affected over the last three weeks for a simple reason. Do you notice anybody stopped smoking in the last three weeks because there was a crisis? You're probably smoking twice as much. So I feel stressed out. Yeah. It's nice to have an addiction as your product or service. But the biggest problem with the tobacco company is always that last step of how much will it cost me. So you know, think about it. If, you have, if you, the company you're valuing has a lawsuit, a big lawsuit, especially one that cuts the heart of the business model, this is your last chance to bring it in. And finally, let's talk about this practice that's become increasingly common where employees get paid with equity. Okay? This equity compensation is called stock-based compensation. Or, and it can take two forms. It can take the form of either options on the stock, where you get the right to buy a stock at a fixed price, or restricted stock. Increasingly, companies have moved to restricted stock, and we'll talk about why. But there are two ways. Again, before we get deeper into this, why do companies pay their employees with equity or 
with restricted stock or options? Incentives. One is incentives, but I think it's way down the list of why they do it. You join Casper. I can almost guarantee you that most of your compensation will take the form of equity. You join Uber, much of your because I mean Ubers right now they are coming higher MBAs. They can't pay the two fifty thousand dollars in cash that Goldman Sachs might pay for an MBA, but they will match it in terms of overall compensation, maybe even more, but it won't be cash. Let me ask you a question: Why does why do Uber and Casper not pay with cash? Because they don't have any. That actually cuts the heart of this entire stock-based compensation because once we let the incentive thing come in. Companies, oh, then they do this dance of, oh, it's really not compensation. It is compensation. You're using it because you don't have the cash. Let's be honest. And once you do that, how you deal with stock-based compensation becomes very simple. So let's start with, uh, with, with, the, with, with, the, with the issue of you know, the, the two kinds of equity that can be offered. One is what are called restricted stock. This is the way 90% of companies now pay employees. You're saying, what's restricted about the stock? With restricted stock, you're given shares in the company, but you're not allowed to sell those shares for a period of time, three years, five years. That's a restriction. So it's shares with a liquidity constraint. You can't sell them. So holding all else constant, restricted shares should be worth a little less than traditional shares because you've lost the liquidity. But they're the easiest problem to deal with. Because if that's the way you're paying your employees, I'm going to add the share count to your total shares outstanding. There might be a little discount on the shares, but I'm going to do my valuation as if everything else applied. If you pay with options, I have a problem. And here's why I have a problem. Those options I can value as if you exercise them today, exercise value today. But I think that's unfair. For the same reason that in that example that we started this class with, just because you gave options the strike price equal to the stock price, I can't assume that no damage is done to me, because those options have a life. In fact, if you've taken an option class or a portion of your class where you talked about options, remember there's a time premium on an option. In other words, you don't get to buy an option at exercise value. You've got to pay a time premium. So the question with options is, how do we bring these options into the process? Because right now, they might not be worth money, but they could be worth money in the future. So I'm going to set up a very simple example of a business granting options. And we're going to work through the process of how it plays out. So this is a company with $100 million in free cash flows of firm, 8% cost of capital. There's 100 million shares outstanding and a billion in debt. It's a very simple valuation. Because it's in stable growth, I can take the 100 million cash flows, divide by R minus G, I come up with 2 billion. I subtract out the debt, I get a value of equity of a billion, divide by the number of shares, $10 per share. Now, the example is very similar to what we set up in the test. Now I give 10 million options with a $10 strike price to the CEO. And that's the same question I asked you, the value of the shares change. And I think we collectively concluded that it doesn't leave us unaffected. You are worse off now than those options. The question is, how do we bring this, these options in? I'm going to take you to three approaches used for dealing with options. I'm going to give you my preferences of which approach I think should be used. And we'll talk about the other two. Here's the first one. It's called the diluted share approach. And here's what you do. You take the value of equity you got. Remember that billion dollars you estimated? And then you take the share count, which is 100, share, 100 million shares, and you say, if these options get exercised, there'll be 10 million shares. I'm going to add that to the denominator, which increases the share count to 1.1 billion, and come up with a value per share of $9.09. .09. See, so all I'm adjusting is the share count. What's unfair about this is when I do this and I tell you the value, what am I missing? No. These options get exercised, right? That's what I'm assuming. But if those options get exercised, what else happens at the company? We get cash. Why? Because to exercise the options, you've got to pay $10 an option. I'm entirely missing the $100 million that's going to come into the company when they exercise, right? If you use a fully diluted approach, which about 50 to 60% of analysts now use to value companies, you're going to undervalue the company's equity because you're acting like there's no exercise value. So is there a way to fix it? What seems to be a simple fix? What if I added the billion dollar, the hundred million dollars I get from excess? You, you see where the hundred million comes from? You have ten million options, ten dollar strike price. I could add the hundred million dollars to the numerator, 
and then divide by the 110 million shares. This is called the treasury stock approach. And this is what sophisticated analysts do to show you that they kind of get this. But if I do that with an at the money option, guess what I get with my value per share? Yeah. The problem with this approach is I'm treating the options as worth exercise value. So you can already see my third approach, right? So what's the right way to do, deal with options? You can't do a zero one. They're not shares or not shares. You can't, you know, you got to deal with them as options. When you use an option pricing model, value an option, you know what you're doing? You're bringing in the likelihood they will get exercised. You're bringing in probabilities. You're coming up with an expected value for the options. So the third approach is what I'm going to do. I'm going to value the options as options with the remaining life to maturity, the variance in the stock price. I'm going to subtract the value of the options from the value of the equity, saying that's value that you gave away. And if I do that, then I should be dividing just by the 100 million shares outstanding because that's what I'm left with as share count. So don't double count. Don't subtract out the value of the options and divide by 110 million shares because this basically takes care of the option problem. To me, this is the cleanest and the best way to deal with options because it treats the options as what they are. They're live options. I should be valuing them as options and subtracting out. So let's try this with the example. But before I do that, there are a couple of things about using option pricing model to employ your options that makes it tricky. You know, option pricing models were developed in 1971 by Fisher Black and Myron Schultz. Black Schultz model, that's why it's called. They won Nobel Prizes for doing it. It was a revolutionary way of thinking about valuation. We'll talk a little bit more later in the class about what underlies the model. But it was designed to value options listed on the CBOE, the Chicago Board of Options. And those options tended to be short term and on listed stock. Okay. We're going to be applying those options, because those are the models out there, we're going to be using those same option pricing models to value employee options. And employee options are not two month or three month, they're often five or 10 year options, they're much more long term. And the act of exercising an employee option can actually affect the stock price. Why? Because if people exercise the option, the share count changes, the value per share could change. So you have a problem taking traditional option pricing models just plugging in the numbers. So for 20 years, companies' excuses for not dealing with options is they say the option pricing models don't work, therefore we're going to not even try to value the options. But that's, you know, that's not true. You can try, you can adapt the models, you can change them. So what I'm going to give you are the changes I use for employee option pricing that allows me to use an option pricing model to value employees, employee options. So let me take the example that we just did. The stock price is $10, but I'm actually going to figure out how much that stock price will drop if all of the options get exercised today. Because when they get exercised, the value, so basically the stock price will go to 958. So instead of using today's stock price, I'm using a dilution adjusted stock price. Okay. The strike price is 10. It's now slightly out of the money option. You have 10 years to maturity, a 40% standard deviation of 4% riskless rent. You put those numbers in, you come up, so if you've never seen a black Scholes, forget about the ND1, ND2, we'll go into it deeper when we talk about real options. The value that I get per option is $5.42. How many options they give away? 10 million options. Each is worth $5.42. They've given away $54.2 million of equity. To value the equity in the shares, I take the billion dollars I got from my DCF value, I subtract out the value of the options, which leaves me with 950 for 945.8, divide that by the actual number of shares, the value per share that I get is 946, lower than the $10 I got with the treasury stock approach because I'm now bringing the time premium, but higher than the $9.09 .09 I got with the diluted shares approach because I am factoring in the exercise value. When you do this, you're essentially reflecting the value of options you've already granted as a company and saying, that's going to be a dead weight on my equity value. I've got to take it out of the equity value to reflect the fact that you've given away a piece of my equity. Okay. So if you look at all of my discounted cash flow models, there's an option tab in every one of them. And if you, I ask you for information. I said, do you have options? If you say yes, I ask you for how many options do you have? What's the strike price? How many years to maturity? I'm not doing this because I'm just curious. I take that, those numbers, I put in an option pricing model, and I value the options. And then I subtract the value of the options from the value of your equity. And if you're a young company where you have a lot of options outstanding, this can drain a significant chunk of the value of your equity. 
and I've got to reflect that my value per share. One mechanical question that often comes up here is you just subtract other value of the options. You might be missing a tax advantage you get when, you, when options get exercised. Right now, the tax law is written differently than the accounting law. You actually get a tax advantage when options get exercised. The, the year that Facebook went public, now, there was two things. One is Facebook got a tax deduction for the options getting exercised, but Mark Zuckerberg had to pay a huge income tax on that same income. So the tax guy gets you one. So don't feel sorry for the tax guy saying, oh, those poor tax guys, let this go. No, they'll get you what the right hand doesn't get you, the left hand will get you. But if you feel that there's, there's got to be a tax adjustment, just take the equity value, multiply by one minus the tax rate. That takes care of the tax issue. A little bit of history on how the account, how accounting is dealt with options. Until 2007, companies, when they granted options to employees, were allowed to take the exercise value of the options as the value of the options. So you know what companies would do? They'd grant options which are at the money. The accountant said, nothing has happened to you, so they'd show no expense at all. So companies basically thought of options as free currency. They said, hey, we can issue options, no price to earnings. And it, it created some really bad practices where boards of directors would give away 15, 20, 25 million options to employees saying, hey, nothing's going to happen to earnings. And finally, in 2007, the accountants woke up and said, this is not good. You're giving away slices of equity. We can't wait for the options to be exercised to give you that expense. We've got to treat it as an expense when it's granted. So since 2007, when companies have had to grant options, you know what they've had to do? They've had to use an option pricing model, and they've gone through different gyrations on which model. They have to value the options and show them as an expense in the year that they're given. And the minute this happened, companies decided to go to the restricted stock approach because basically there's no advantage now to granting options. It's a messy process. It creates a bad set of incentives for managers because Managers don't think like equity investors. Remember, options benefit from variance and high volatility, so managers actually take more risk than they should. So the shift to restricted stock came about because accounting finally came to its senses on dealing with options. So today, when you look at your company's expenses, inside your cost of goods sold or employee expenses is the option expense of options granted this year. But it's creating an issue because there are some companies out there which have stopped granting options but still have deadweight options in the past. There's some companies out there that have never granted options that are starting to give options now and some companies that have both. And the reason I say that is if you have options that you expect to get granted in the future, what I just did doesn't take care of it because all I've done by valuing existing options is I've dealt with your past. If you're continuing to do this, then I'm going to take the logic of, hey, this is like any other compensation expense. I'm going to treat it as an expense, and I'm going to subtract it out to get to earnings and cash flows. Have any of you seen the adjusted EBITDA numbers that young companies report? Tesla does it, Casper does it, Uber does it. Have any of you seen that calculation? Somebody help me out there. What's, what's the adjusted portion of most of these adjusted EBITDAs? What are companies doing? They take the EBITDA, and you know what they add back to it to get to adjusted EBITDA? All stock-based compensation. What a pile of crap. They say it's not a cash flow. Really? You skipped a step, and you're telling me it's not a cash flow? Because if you issued those options in the market and paid the cash, it would be in a cash flow? It makes absolutely no sense, but analysts go along with it. Adjusted EBITDA? It's a stupid, absurd practice. There's no other way to describe it. But companies do it because people let them get away with it. You cannot add back stock-based compensation. It is an expense. The fact that you paid with shares doesn't make it any less of an expense. So I'm going to treat it like any other expense. And here's what it's going to do. It's going to lower. So if you're going to continue to give options in the future, it's going to lower your earnings in the future, your cash flows in the future, your value. It might look like I'm punishing the company twice, but I'm actually punishing it for two different things. The lowering of the cash flows for future option grants, the subtraction out of the value of the options is for options you gave in the past. Amazon, for instance, no longer grants options to its employees, but it still has some residue of options from way back. A company like Cisco still does both. I have to do both. So depending on the company, you're going to see this both play out. So here's, here's the bottom line in options. Options can affect your equity value. 
and they will affect it more in companies where, you know, where there's a lot of uncertainty, which happens to be the kinds of companies that grant options, technology companies. And it'll be a function of how long term those options are. Ten year options will have a bigger effect. So as you get closer to maturity, you're going to see the option value kind of get lower. But if, if you get a chance, take a look at what Elon Musk's option arrangements are that the board of directors gave him about three years ago. It's actually the scariest part of a $640 stock price is how many options the board of directors at Tesla gave Elon Musk and the terms on those options. It's actually mind-boggling. Tells you a little bit about how much of a rubber stamp the, corporate, the board of directors at Tesla is, that they would give these options. But if you value Tesla per share, you have to bring in the value of those options. There's no way around it. And it's a huge drag on the stock price, especially as stock prices go up. So that's the bottom line on options. Any questions on options? You know what? I'm going to stop there. I almost never stop early, right? That's so bad. That's OK. So let's call this a viral early letdown. <laughs> so that you can all go back home into your little, you know, have you seen the Seinfeld episode of the bubble boy? Now, if you have not seen it, you need to get a bubble, get into it now. But I will see you on Wednesday. Yeah. wondering like in terms of when you're talking about risk before you talked about like discrete and continuous risk and continuous risk is easier to measure and um, implied to valuation so like for example like in terms of Aramco valuation for example how would you like would you like account, would, would it be possible for because this is a very like this event could be more seen as a discrete than a something continuous yeah, right? How would you account that under valuation? But how do you account for like how much to put as a risk for something like that? Very easy, right? You know how many barriers of oil they can use. Last year they they sold it at fifty five dollars a barrel, now you sell it at thirty two. And in fact the Saudi government is very clear on how much oil they plan to sell every year. They set the target. That's mm -hmm. a big part of what OPEC has to plan around. Mm -hmm. Is right now I think it's nine and a half million barrels, they're chosen to go to eleven million barrels, eleven million times thirty two is what they're going to give you the revenue for this year, three hundred and thirty two billion. Mm -hmm. The discrete risk component is lower oil prices are dangerous politically for oil prices, right? Because everybody rests on oil revenue to keep the population kind of kind of revolting. So your discrete risk here is will that lower oil price create turmoil in Saudi Arabia that can shake the house of Saudi? Also, just one more question. Yeah. I was just afraid, like, what's happening in the markets recently. Like, I know you went through, like, 2008 financial crisis as well and everything. So do you, like, how do you see this, like, playing out potentially? Nobody knows. Okay. There's so much uncertainty, right? So it will play out, and there will be a market at the end. There will be an economy to okay. that. And that's why you almost have to step away and think about, okay, for the next eight months, terrible things will happen to stocks and earnings. It's so much to give us. Have a company, very large. Worst thing to happen is some companies and others. It's not. The question that I ask is once this is over, which companies are going to see a recovery back to something like steady state? Which companies are damaged permanently? And what can cause you to be damaged permanently is if the business model is broken, like the cruise line. So you have so much debt that you don't make it through. 
to the next eight months. How about for us, like people, students who potentially go into finance careers going forward? Do you think like banks are yeah, better positioned? Of course, positioned? Gonna, of course it's going to be a, you know, it's right. going to hurt your <laughs> job prospects. Because 2008 did, right? 2008 right. made a huge difference in people who were being hired in 2009. Mm -hmm. Are you senior or junior? Junior. So I have a summer internship, but I'm just afraid of what it's could potentially happen. I mean, happen. yes, everything is up in the air. <laughs> this is the kind of shock that right. really can cause all kinds of ripples all across because deals are going to drop off because right. companies don't have the money. Deals drop off. Banks can't, don't have the work. If they don't have the work, they don't want the interns. What my favor is the fact that banks don't hire interns to do work. They hire interns as a preview of whether they want to give you a full-time job. So right. To the extent that they still want to do that, they're not going to pull their internship offers. How, how about like in terms of specific groups within investment banking? Do you think has more resilience, or no, not really? There's nobody who can be resilient <laughs> to something like this. I see. Okay, thank you. Any deal-oriented group is going to be hurt more. M and A is going to be hurt more right. than traditional corporate finance. I see. Yeah. Hi, Professor. Um, I just kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on uh, semiconductors right now because so I've been Nvidia watching. Nvidia, you talking about Intel? Uh, AMD, actually. Uh, I think you know, AM. I mean, let's face it. You know, semi this is the kind of uh, demand which is going to be yeah. just delayed. It's right. not like you're permanently stopped from right. buying. Yeah, right I now your supply chains are hurt because mm -hmm. of Chinese production. Your produ your sales will be hurt because the right. people you're selling to. But you know that when there is a catch up. So right. This is so, if you bought AMD and said, look, I know, and, and you want to pick AMD versus in, which one is hurt, hurt the most, right. which one do you think will come back? So, so, so the main thing is I was trying to understand, you know, the market drop specifically for some of the conductors today because AMD was down like over 10% on a drop in oil prices, which seemed a bit odd to me because, right, cheaper oil prices wouldn't correlate well, to. Yeah, right. No, the 10% drop in the market is down 8%. 10% yeah. is not that different, right? If you have yeah. 1.25, that's pretty much what you would expect. So that doesn't, but it drop 30%, then right. that's different. 10% yeah. actually today. Mm -hmm. Is about what you'd expect uh, one of the, the higher segment, the risk segments of the market to okay. do. So I would you know that by itself is neither here nor there. Okay. That's not a sign. But I think that collectively you can look at the drop and sure. say how much has the drop been and does it deserve it? Right. Okay. Now that's why I said the question really is not how much will earnings drop this year, but how much sure. will that earnings will be recouped. Right. If you're in a kind of business where most of it will come back because people are just delaying or deferring, right. that's a better business than a, mo a model where those people are not coming back. Got it. And, and just to, um, I guess, tack on to the, um, the previous conversation, mm -hmm. um, regarding, so I've been paying attention to hedge funds as well and understanding yeah. like their exposures in the fixed, fixed income uh, sectors as well. And so where do you see this going in terms of how the market's kind of well, going with these? Fixed income is yeah. going to be the next big cycle of fire because yeah. what, what this drop has created, especially the oil price drop, has created a whole host of distressed, potentially distressed companies. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. almost every oil company with a lot of debt is now in serious trouble. And that's yeah. a lot of debt out there. And that debt gets into trouble and there's distress and spills over into the rest of the oil. Yeah at the high yield market. So you're going to see it happen in patterns. You know, when you're double D, single D, triple C rated, you're going yeah. to see a much bigger impact in the debt, even if you're not an oil company. Right. Because problems there will spill over. Right. So you're going to see the high yield market, especially being mm. pummeled, as it always gotcha. gets in right. a period like this one, because okay. you're worried about companies not defaulting. Right. But if you go through the year and there is no serious default, companies find a way to muddle through, then yeah. I you might be under might be exact this might be the time if yeah. you want to get into high yield that you want to get into it because Got the it. disaster that you were pricing in is right. Happen. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a good day. Uh, a bit more hypothetical and like less related yeah. to the class. Um I'm writing this essay about about Netflix and like it's for T V class, but I'm like my whole argument argument is like built upon some product that they were like that they never released. Mm -hmm. What do you think like I guess like obviously given Corona it's like a different kind of discussion, but just given like the whole thing in general if they had like a more diverse, I like looking like more diversified revenue stream compared to just the subscription, because like looking at how they're taking on so much debt, and like my whole my whole argument is that it's like Roku that the company mm -hmm. now is originally like a project within yeah. Netflix. Yeah. Um, my whole argument is that like had they built it out to be on, to be its own project, like it could have a like kind of given them stronger footing within that home entertainment mm -hmm. area, but also would have protected them against like when like their massive amounts of debt and like all the subscription stuff. I'm just like trying to I guess mm -hmm. wondering what you're you on that. If like you think it's like set like a, because I've read a lot of different people who's like, oh, it's a good thing that they rolled it's it out. It's a viable story. I mean, you can okay. have to build out the story. Yeah. I mean, there are lots of 
put parts which are of weak links. I yeah. Heard, I mean, my sense is a standalone company could grow forever. I've competed against somebody that has much capital and access to capital, as a Netflix or an Amazon or I mean, let's face it, the competition is not just Netflix. The fact that Amazon, you know, it could be Apple, it could be any of the companies that essentially have now created their own version of. of of what Roku offers. Yeah. So my guess is for this, you need some aspect of a niche component of the market where Roku would have had an advantage. Okay. And I think you can tell a story where you can create that niche component in addition to something else they could have done. They could have survived as a standalone company and done things differently, you know, which might have been more valuable. Okay. Yeah. I think I just want to bounce the idea off. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, hi, Professor. So um, we were working on the project over the mm -hmm. weekend, and we ran into one issue was, um, you know, we have to adjust for R&D and oper um, operating leases on our operating income, adjust for the, mm -hmm. um, but when we do that and we're calculating your synthetic rating, mm -hmm. it makes a big difference on the cost of debt that I came. So I was doing Beyond Meat, and when I adjusted for R&D expenses, my operating income shot up by a lot, and mm -hmm. that, like, reduced my cost of debt by 10%. So, but wha How what I was. What does Beyond Meat have? It has quite a, quite a lot of. I think. Beyond Meat is not very much better. The percent of their capital is probably two, three percent of their capital. Where's all the debt that they're finding for Beyond Meat? In relative the market value, it's almost nothing. That's why the, the only reason you care about the cost of debt is how it affects the cost of capital. But I'm saying you seem to be, I mean, this is right. a dance you're doing on something that's two or three percent of capital. Who really cares? You could give them a triple A rating, a triple B, or a triple C. Your cost of capital is pretty much going to be the same under all three scenarios. Okay. Right? Okay. Right. So I think that the rating might shoot up, but I'm saying the only reason it shoots up is the debt is so small, the interest expense is so small that changes in your operating income are just going to magnify. Okay. Everything. If they right. had more debt and more interest expenses, your rating would not uh, shoot up that dramatically. Okay. It's actually a signal that you shouldn't be worrying that much about debt, that okay. it shoots up so much. It's because okay. it's shooting up because interest expenses are so trivial, so right. small. Okay. But if I triple my operating income, my interest coverage ratio goes from 3 to 30. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Also for Beyond Meat, so because um, so I was using LTM numbers for most of their um, income statement numbers, mm -hmm. but it was hard to do LTM for stuff like debt and. Uh, you don't do an LTM for a balance sheet item. You do so the you LTM just use the latest for flow. Oh, LTM, you don't do an LTM for a stock. It makes no sense, right? LTM is when you want to add, you want to add a flow. So income statement numbers are flow. Right, but balance sheet. But I have updated numbers for debt that are oh, more recent from their queues. That's fine. That's, you can use that. But, uh, but debt numbers, you don't add up. Basically, yeah, you don't no. numbers. Most what recent numbers. Most, yeah. So how do you get something that's after the queue? Or how do you get a debt number that is more Like, what I mean, the la I'm using debt from the latest queue, but then stuff like pe um, pinch uh, options and stuff that are from their, like, that's not in their queue. Okay, that's, that's, yeah, that's got nothing to do with the debt. So basically, you're saying some of the items you should not update because yeah. they're only in the 10K, right? Yeah. Options and so on. I'm trying to apply to like the senior like honors program and mm -hmm. write a thesis and I find like the complexity thing really interesting because yep. I also find like last summer when I was yep. doing my internship there's at least like five companies in China con uh, conducting fraudulent acts. China complexity yeah. is almost built into corporate yeah. design because their objective is the to get people to understand as little about the company the as they can. They sort of hold a company which hold another company and hold another company mm -hmm. to cover their fraudulent acts. So I'm wondering whether it would be like like feasible and like beneficial for me to... You have to yeah. get, find something where the information yeah. is easily accessible, right? Because yeah. if the hand collect that data, you're going to go crazy. Yeah. If you're going to do it, you probably should pick a market where you can't pick Shenzhen. You've got to pick Hong Kong. Yeah. You've got to pick maybe the 50 largest companies yeah. in Hong Kong and then pick each one. Yeah. So if you're going to go down that route, be realistic. Don't okay. try and look at all Chinese companies yeah. and look at complexity because you don't. the data will be oh. really tough to get. So should I do like, for example, within industry or? You, I mean, w once yeah. you do it, you, go, you have to have a hypothesis. What's yeah. your hypothesis? Are those companies are priced more lower or higher? Yeah, I think it should be lower. So that's your yeah. hypothesis. So what you'd have to do is come up with whatever yeah. m pricing metric you have, price okay. earnings, price to book, and then compare it to what the price earnings ratio. So let's take Lenovo, yeah. right? Let's say Lenovo is a complex company. You compare yeah. to the price earnings ratios of other computer manufacturers around yeah. the world, you should get a lower PE ratio than yeah. Lenovo's or less. 
There are lots of eyes, eyes to dot and yeah. T's to cross here, but that's pretty much do, what it is. Do you think, for example, doing like, like linguistic stuff, for example, analyzing the words and stuff would be like Linguistic relevant? stuff in what sense? For example, like analyzing the words. Example, yeah, then you really have to read every annual yeah. report, then your sample size has yeah. to get really small. So if yeah. you're going to go that route, remember you're going to be reading hundreds of pages, yeah. you're going to be looking for words that yeah. you think are, that's fine, but then you've got to maybe bring your ambitions down to yeah. 15 or 20 something. Okay. And say, okay, I'm going to look at this and then yeah. I'm going to come up with, the problem is you've got to convert that linguist, whatever yeah. the measure yeah. is, into a standardized score. Yeah, because there's friends of mine trying to, like, use like some algorithm to just mm -hmm. capture That's like fine, as long yeah. as, so if you can use an algorithm that 